Welcome back, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne. This is Inside Exec. Today we are joined by a guest, and that is John Alford, and he's talking to us from Manly in Sydney, New South Wales. And I'm going to let Fuliana introduce him. I'm very delighted to introduce John. I've known John now for well over 25 years. It's been an absolute pleasure working with John because he helped me in many, many ways. But what I like most is that he's expert at what he does, but it's the way he does it. He really treats everyone with respect. He tells everything to the needs of the person, highly ethical, and the journey wouldn't have lasted as long as this if it wasn't for John. So, John, thank you for that to start off with. John, at the moment, is the Chief Investment Officer of Value Investment Partners, He's been in the finance industry for over 35 years. And so you can imagine what a rich career and what areas of finance he worked in. What I thought it might be best, John, if you can maybe take us through that journey and tell us at a high level to start off with, where did you start? How did you get there? And where are you now? The beginning was uh, quite interesting and I owe my career start to my uh, economics teacher at Forest High. My best mate Charlie and I both had summer jobs and we earned quite a bit of money over the what would have been the summer of 82, 83. We sat down and uh, together and we discussed what we could do with our money. We discounted banks as not going to change our world in any way, shape or form. We discounted uh, lotteries and everything else like that. And given that we were doing economic, we, we approached my economics teacher and Mr. Fraser. He hand us a, handed us a copy of the Bulletin magazine and oh. said, read the article called Speculator's Diary. So both Charlie and I went away, read our article. The Speculator's Diary recommended a stock called uh, Mincorp. So both Charlie and I put $400 each into Mincorp at $0.10 cents a share. And we sold it two weeks later for $0.14 cents a share. And we thought that was spectacular. <laughs> well, I thought this was how our uh, career was going to, uh, my career was going to go. Uh, the next stock we chose, I've forgotten the name of it, but it was, uh, we bought it for one cent and sold it for two cents and therefore doubling our money again. And that had me completely and utterly hooked. In finishing school, I wrote a letter to every stockbroking firm in Sydney and uh, asking for a job. A little firm called Herbert P. Cooper and Son picked me up. At the time, they were interested in me in that they had never hired a public school boy. All their recruits were from the private schools. And it was only that their private school guy that they had uh, employed took another job and left them high and dry when they went back to my letter. So they employed me um, first as a, as a junior phone clerk on the trading floor. I should point out that the interview uh, is not like uh, today's interview. Most of the questions were re- regarding uh, rugby because uh, in my school resume, it had captain of the first 15. What I didn't point out to them was that uh, we only had one 15 at uh, Forest High, <laughs> but, uh, that, uh, but it sounded good in the, uh, the resume anyway. So my first job was as phone clerk on the trading floor, whereby I would uh, answer the phones for coming down from the office to the stock exchange trading floor and relay the orders to the operators. Or We called them operators, but uh, mm-hmm. traders would be a, another description. I was in heaven. I was playing in um, one of the great, great jobs or markets of the of the world, and that was uh, that was seriously exciting. The big boss, to James Cooper, was chairman of the stock exchange at the time, and his son, who was a trader, was going on a three month sabbatical, and Jim needed someone to fill in. And given that they were a small firm, Jim, being chairman of the stock exchange, uh, gave me an exemption as a young 19-year-old to, uh, to be the youngest ever trader on the stock exchange floor. At, at the time, the rules were that you had to be 21. So a little bit of a helping hand from the boss sort of launched my career a little bit earlier than, uh, than most. That job was, as, as I said, was one of the most exciting jobs in the world. From there, I went to a, uh, another firm, uh, Brown Lancaster. They offered me double the salary that I was on. So uh, as a young boy, that was that was pretty exciting. And, and to put it in perspective, I still remember that I was getting $11,000 from Herbert P. Cooper and Son a year. In, that was in 1986. And I went to $22,000. So that was a massive increase in salary. And then uh, Brown Lancaster and company was taken over by uh, Prudential Beige. Well, it split. Half the firm went to Prudential Beige. And so suddenly I was now still in 1986, was now working for one of the, the mega 
broking firms of the world. Uh, at the time, Prudential Base and Solomon Brothers in the US were probably the two broking houses, two biggest broking houses in the world. So being in the right spot at the right time, my salary doubled again. So salary doubled twice in six months. As young guys on the trading floor, we were earning mega, mega dollars compared to other people. I know that my bonus for 1987, July 87, was 100% of my salary. Wow. Um, so as you can work out, the uh, the numbers as a young 20-year-old were spectacular. And of course, as a young 20-year-old earning that type of money, which was far greater than anybody else I knew, led to uh, quite an exciting life of working hard and, and also playing hard. Inside Prubesh, because it was a, a global company, we used to work around the clock. So a parcel of shares that we would have for our institutional clients would be made available on the world stock exchanges. So my last job of an evening was to hand over the uh, the orders to, to the London office, which would then in turn hand it across to New York during the night and then pass the orders back to us in, in Sydney and Melbourne in the mornings. So quite often you'd get phone calls at all hours of the night with dramatic turns of events. That was all going very well and uh, we did some exciting things. I still remember the uh, the biggest trade I ever did. One, one of Prudential Base's biggest clients was uh, News Corporation. When News Corporation bought Herald Weekly Times, I sold uh, Kerry Packer's $400 million worth of Herald Weekly Times to, to Rupert Murdoch. In those days, I mean, it's, it's still a large amount of money, but uh, in those days, it was a massive amount of money. That was my biggest ever trade. <laughs> in October 87, we obviously had the 87 stock market crash. That was probably the most the most amazing day. The stress levels and everything was um, was through the roof, and of course the adrenaline was so high. And on those big trading days, the adrenaline rush that you used to get in handling millions of dollars as a young twenty twenty one year old was quite surreal, actually. And I still remember coming off the trading floor after at lunchtime on that. October 87, literally shaking because of the adrenaline rush mm. come down. The markets went very quiet after the 87 crash. We would sit around doing very little as the orders all dried up and uh, markets all went, as I said, very quiet and, and low trading volumes. And back in those days, we had individual exchanges. So uh, Sydney exchange would be uh, different to the Melbourne exchange and Perth exchange and so on. And so as a, a way of amusing ourselves, we would look for price differentials between the different exchanges. And you might find a stock at selling at 31 cents in Perth and someone buying at 33 cents in Sydney. So you would sell in Sydney at 31 and buy in Perth at 30, uh, sorry, sell in Sydney at 33 and buy in Perth at 31 and, and make a handful of dollars. And I used that to, uh, I guess, party with my uh, my colleague over in Perth. And she would come over to Sydney um, uh, when we'd built up enough money in our, in our trading account and, and vice versa. And we'd go to parties for the weekend. And as I said, as, as, a, as a young 21-year-old, flitting around the country, going to parties was pretty cool. <laughs> the, yes. um, <laughs> and, um, and, and of course, back in those days, the, the, the floor, the trading floor was open outcry. So we had the old chalkies and the boards and and there'd be lots of screaming and yelling and it, it was quite amazing how you actually off the two or three hundred people on the trading floor you got to recognize everybody's voices and you could actually hear through the canopy of noise you, you your hearing became trained to be able to pick out things that you were interested in i often look back on that and when i go into a noisy restaurant or something either like uh, and uh, or a uh, noisy noisy bar and and i can still have that ability to siphon off noises from some areas and concentrate on noises from other areas so it's, it was a skill that hasn't left me yet after that news corp decided to uh, rupert herbers of court decided to uh, list on the new york uh, stock exchange and he handed in his uh, australian citizenship and got a u.s citizenship and i was chosen to to go to new york to uh, to establish the the market in news corp right at uh, right at the beginning that was uh, uh, would have been about January 1989. That was another wonderful experience in my life, uh, working on the New York trading floor. I made mention before of the, the biggest trade I ever did was $400 million. The day that I got there, I was put on a, one of the uh, Dow Jones stocks to, uh, to learn how the U.S. guys traded. And that guy had traded $300 million before lunchtime, and it was a normal day. So, so that was a great 
perspective on how small Australia is in, in, in the, the big world of finance in that uh, we'd like to think that we're um, big and strong and everything else like that. But Australia's financial markets are but a minnow of the, uh, the rest of the world. And, and that perspective uh, was, was eye-opening to a young boy. The day before the October 87 stock market crash, the screen trading started. So the first stocks went onto a computer screen to be traded and, and not have the open outcry chalkboards. Of course, on the 87 crash day, that computer all collapsed. And we, we were hoping that that uh, computerized system, that would be the death knell of it. Uh, however, it wasn't to be. And in uh, late 1990, the, the trading floor closed and everything went back to computers in the in the office. I was given the option of uh, moving to Melbourne and working out of the, the Melbourne office or taking redundancy. Taking redundancy uh, seemed like a better option to me in that my life, my family and everything was in Sydney. By that stage, I had been playing rugby. However, my old coach, Slaggy Miller, had a rule that if you didn't make training, you played in fifth grade. And, and given that I had to run the book into, into London every night, I couldn't get to trainings. So I'd been playing rugby, and but didn't like fifth grade. So my rugby career came to a, an abrupt halt. But in um, in doing that, I actually started sailing out of Middle Harbour Yacht Club, which was far more practical in that I didn't have to go to trainings and could arrive at nine o'clock on a on a Saturday morning and go sailing for the day. That led to a, a lifelong love affair of sailing, which I still do and uh, and, and race competitively. So there was quite a few changes in that time in my life, in that my sport changed. And my career, the best career in the world has ended into uh, a, a quote from uh, the, the wonderful book, Bonfires of the Vanities. I had thought myself as being a master of the universe was the line in the book. So in taking the redundancy and sitting around twiddling my thumbs for a couple of months, I uh, realized I was no longer master of the universe. That was probably a great lesson in that I was skilled in a job that no longer existed. But obviously in trading my shares. It had led, led me to understand markets and increase my knowledge of economics greatly. I went to see a good sailing mate of mine, uh, Dennis Bashford. I went to roll over my poultry summer super back then. The superannuation wasn't large back in those days and I had a small amount of money and Dennis was running a um, financial planning firm out of IWF Funds Management. I went to see him to roll over my little bit of super and walked out with a job as a financial planner. That was early 1991. I have been in that role up until very recently, uh, full time. So what's that, 30, 30 odd years as a financial planner. I've got to say that I've totally and utterly loved that position. And you know, I've met some amazing people, some wonderful clients. And I've loved the journey that I've had with my clients over the years, building their goals and their strategies with them and then implementing them. And, and now I've, uh, I've got the, the luxury of actually seeing them come to fruition, which is such a wonderful feeling for me. It gives me ap- absolute utmost satisfaction. I'd like to just go back to the very beginning. Did you have anything else in mind as a career that you wanted to do? Did you have any idea what you wanted to do? No, I didn't. Prior to that, uh, those little share trades, I was at a loss as to what I wanted to do. I guess my plan, uh, I did like economics and economics was my yeah. favourite subject at school. Yeah. So I was had every intention of going to university and doing an economics degree and, uh, and that's as far as I'd got. Did you always have an affinity for numbers? Did you always feel well, comfortable math, around math numbers? Math was also another good subject for yeah. me. So numbers uh, come naturally to me. I'm actually very dyslexic. One of the problems with that first job as phone clerk was the order would come down to sell 3,654 BHP shares. And I'd write on the paper, sell 6,345, um. which caused all sorts of consternation. Most guys would have been fired on the spot for repeated <laughs> offences of doing that. However, the two I see, uh, Mr. Ian Boyce, his son, uh, his grandson rather, was involved in a study at Sydney Uni on dyslexia, uh, which was the early days of them identifying it. Mm. And he said, you've got the same problem as my grandson. You need to go along to this study. And so I was. I was sent along to Sydney Uni by my boss and, and sure enough, they diagnosed the dyslexia. It generated, in probably the, the easiest way to describe it, it generated and it came out in the economics. My economic teacher would write on the report card, John knows his stuff. However, he doesn't concentrate when he's writing it. So I'd be able to stand up and, and explain the accelerator principle in economics without a problem verbally, but to put it into writing was a problem for me. That Once it was identified, 
I then made steps to correct it and have done so ever since. You talked a little bit about sport and about lifestyle and, and all those sorts of things. I'm interested in the fact that obviously that, that earlier lifestyle was frenetic pace mm-hmm. and you partied at that same pace as you worked. Did sport offer you something different? Or were you as competitive in that arena as everywhere else? <laughs> I, I suspect I've always been in the competitive in that arena, in any arena that I've been in. And, and, and again, that can go back to the early days on the trading floor, whereby you, know, you were competing against a day in, day out for yeah. lines of stock, for better prices, to get a jump on the, the guy that you've been working with for years on end and you know, just stand next to him tomorrow, even though you've, you, you've screwed him today. So that competitive nature is definitely in my bones. Going out for a casual sale, for example, on a on a twilight race, really doesn't do it for me as much as offshore racing, whereby you're doing Sydney mm-hmm. to Hobart's and long ocean races and and so forth like that. In some of those cases, you're actually competing against yourself mm-hmm. to to be mentally tough. I can assure you that sitting on a sailing boat in a uh, in a sixty knot gale in the, the dead of winter is not fun. But if you wouldn't do it if you didn't have that that toughness because the rewards, are, and, and I imagine it's with everybody from the mountain climber to uh, to every professional sportsman or anybody who gets to the top, the, the reward is actually getting to the top. And, and for that, you're prepared to, uh, to, to do the hard yards first with the goal in mind to get to the top. And now that goes for the sports, it goes for the business, it goes for, for your life, it goes for your family. Yes, you might have to make hard decisions. Keep that goal. Get that goal of what you want is always the most important thing. Try not to crucify people along the way. With that overview into John's career up to date, we're going to take a break in our discussion with him. In the next two parts of the podcast, we'll go into a little bit more depth about the experiences that John has had and how he relates them to his continuing education around his career. But for now, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne. We're talking with John Alford, and this is Inside Exec. 